Hello. Good morning, everybody. Um, welcome to New America. My name is Kevin Carey. I'm the Vice President for Education Policy and uh, Knowledge Management here. Um, we're delighted to have you, uh, both the folks attending in person and everyone who's watching this um, online, uh, for what's going to be a great discussion about kickstarting the digital heartland. Um, this discussion is a collaboration between New America's education policy and cybersecurity programs and Future Tense, which is a partnership between Arizona State University, New America, uh, Slate Magazine, um, and a special thanks to Issues in, in Science and Technology for sponsoring this event. Um, so we're going to have two parts to the event today. The first is going to be a discussion between um, our fearless leader, Anne-Marie Slaughter, um, and Dr. Mark Hagerot, who is the chancellor of the North Dakota University System. Uh, Dr. Hagerot is a North Dakota native who had a long career um, at the US Naval Academy before coming home to head up the university system. Um, this is, uh, we're going to get right into the discussion. I just want to say this is an issue that really resonates with us here at New America. Um, we're an organization that thinks a lot about technology um, and opportunity and how those things um, don't just happen by themselves. Uh, we can't assume that the large forces of technology and the economy and the way that our society is organized geographically will necessarily work out in a way that really um, renews the promise of America, which is the core mission here at, uh, at New America. Um, these are decisions that we have to make, and I think that uh, Chancellor Hagerat has really outlined um, a provocative and very interesting idea for how we can really look back to the legacy of some of the best public policy decisions that have ever, ever been made in the United States um, and really rethink them and retool them for the problems that we have to solve now and the world that we live in now. Um, so I'm going to be sitting over here, mostly just enjoying the conversation between the two of you. Uh, and I would ask Chancellor Hagerot to uh, kick it off and tell us about your great idea. First, I have to thank New America and this visionary um, because about four years ago, I came to her with this idea and a lot of people said, this is a crazy thing. Um, and she said, you should keep working on it, keep working on it. And uh, as the world has changed just in four years, pretty dramatically, um, getting this idea forward, uh, you know, promoting it like you can in this session is just so important. Um, the first thing I would say is, you know, in many ways, you can go about life going, you know, things are pretty much the same, you know, at a micro level, right? You wake up, you put some toast in the toaster. That may not have changed from when you were a, a child. But at a macro level, things are changing in such a radical way. And as an old professor, I like to bring some visual aids. Uh, so <laughs> I checked it I che yeah, with yellow <laughs> stickies. But, um, but you start looking at a bunch of things happening, and you're like, well, how do you tie this together? For example, this was McKinsey's incredible study of the future of work. And they say in here, without bold, well-targeted interventions, digital automation can further concentrate growth and opportunity with portentous consequences for the future. So you see something like that. Then, then I just pulled this off just a couple days ago from the Atlantic. Bots are destroying the political discourse because the voters can't discern what technologically is happening. Then the Economist comes out and says there's a battle for, battle for digital supremacy for the military people here, and I'm, I'm glad uh, the director of NICE is here, Rodney, he is on the front line of the digital war for talent. Uh, they're going to produce more engineers um, than I think Europe, the United States all combined in this world. But then while we're being in this race, we see rural America is becoming the new inner city with millions of Americans and hardworking farm kids. Cities out of the Wall Street Journal continue to pull ahead at growth rates that are rapidly uh, pulling away from rural areas. Yet when it comes to academia, the cover of the Chronicle is perpetuating prestige at elite universities. That's the undercurrent. You hear an incredibly innovative effort, and I respect immensely Peter Blake, the Chancellor of Virginia, and Stephen Murray. They were featured, the AQ, Amazon Q2 here. But you read the last line they say is, we would love for all rural America to win, but our focus is Virginia. Um, so we have an incredible event happening, um, the emergence of digital world that we can see with digitization, robotics, 
Uh, and in North Dakota, so there's several people in North Dakota, some of our visionaries are here, including a student that proposed the first um, student code of ethics for AI and student data. Jared is there. Um, so out of little old North Dakota, some interesting things happen. Uh, the hotbed of the progressive era, the first state to have a recall to governor, the first state to have direct elections for primaries, which Iowa might want to consider. Um, <laughs> we did this back in 1920s. Um, but this world is emerging both physically, um, and North Dakota is a huge test center for robotics, but also in cyberspace. People spend, um, you know, one of our colleges just won uh, the eSports game. Um, and these two things are emerging, but the problem is, if I can be so blunt, is insecurity, inequality is growing, opportunity is declining in many of these areas, as pointed out, and the quality of life. Just think of, of facial recognition technology. What, what is the good life? And so um, to do parts and pieces, which a lot of people are doing incredibly wonderful work at universities, at states, but as we begin the conversation, there is this, this um, poaching effect, which makes it very hard for, for rural and Midwest areas that have incredible talent to build their programs up without some interventions. And um, we get more into the model, uh, we want to talk about it. But that's kind of laying the setting of, of the problem, how we see it. And, uh, and I have a solution in the magazine out there, in the article, and we can talk more about it if, if we want to jump into that. So Great. Yeah. All right, I'm going I'm to talk for a minute and then toss the ball back to you okay. to put that solution <laughs> on the table yeah. so we, can, uh, we really can, can debate it. But I, uh, I think you started in the right place, which is we are in an era that demands profound change. And uh, indeed, one of the reasons I left a, a university to come and, and run New America was this sense that whether you compare us to the progressive era of 100 years ago, where, remember, we, we transformed this country 100 years ago, right? We, we went from uh, electing senators through the upper houses of, Congress, of, of state legislatures to direct election of senators. We moved to primaries. We adopted the income tax. We adopted trust busting. If you look at the United States in 1900, versus 1920, it is dramatic change across the board. And it was driven by technology, right? It was driven in many ways because the Industrial Revolution of the 19th century had upended everything. Uh, and we, it, takes, it takes decades to catch up, but ultimately we needed a new educational system, we needed people to go to high school, we needed different universities, land-grant universities, uh, and then we needed all the policies to once again have a democracy uh, in that world. And I see us, as entering that same period. I mean, really, whether it's, you know, it's probably more 2008, the beginning, if you look at, at Obama's election and then Trump's election, where, but we need that kind of really big change. Uh, and New America is about renewing the promise of America, living up to our ideals, which we are definitely you know, we've never done perfectly, we never will do perfectly. I would say the gap between our ideals and our reality is particularly uh, acute at the moment. And to, but to, to really do that, we need sweeping change and we need to believe that it's possible again. Because I do often don't recognize this country. I think, you know, look at this phenomenal country and all the talent across the country, not just on the coast, very much across the country. How do we harness it? One of the things that, that Kevin's program and all the people from, at New America who work on education convinced me is one of the places we have to start is massively changing our educational system. So Kevin's book, The End of College, which you were writing when I first got here, uh, was really the first what time I thought, wait a minute, college can no longer be four years at, you know, in some campus, which it only is for 14% of Americans anyway. Only 14% of Americans go to a four-year residential college. But we need instead to think about higher learning or higher education as the thing you do from high school for the rest of your life in many different ways. And then we have to think about the places that provide that education very differently. I spent my life pretty much in the Ivy League, uh, and it's great. Wonderful. I still live in Princeton. I, you know, it's an extraordinary university. But when I look at where change is coming from, it's not being led by our oldest, pres most prestigious, traditionally universities. It's being led by community colleges, big state universities, people who 
have the vision and the ability really to innovate. So with all of that, Mark is basically proposing a new generation of public universities, of high, institutions of higher learning and education. Uh, and when he brought it to me four years ago, yes, a lot of big ideas seem crazy initially, right? That's always <laughs> the story, is people say it goes from it's crazy to it's possible to it's obvious. Uh, and so I, I will roll it out and let's right. just see if whether it's really stands Great. the light of Kevin and this right. audience's scrutiny. Right. Okay. Sorry, I'm using my hands. <laughs> All right. So, um, well, thank you for setting that up. Um, so there's, so this is recognition that people are trying, and they generally are trying. Um, and I know there's some faculty members uh, from one of our universities are here for a conference, and I'm so glad to see we have several tribal presidents here. Um, we have Dr. Lindquist here, Dr. McDonald here. Uh, I think Stephanie Hammett, you're here as well from Minnesota. Um, and um, and so part of this was. You know, experience I had as a historian of technology, observing what was happening and studying the evolution of complex systems, and then getting to North Dakota, seeing the, um, the power of place. And, and the Native Americans talk about this, their place is sacred, mm -hmm. okay? And our, our, our society keeps saying, just go wherever, move wherever, uh, be this mobile person. Um, and that's what the good life is. And, and, and visiting the tribal colleges, uh, Standing Rock, where Sitting Bull, um, was buried, and, and I won't get the quote exactly right, but famously said, you know, who will help me build a future for our children? I mean, talk about wisdom. And so as it began to percolate going, hold on, we just can't keep moving people uh, and, and to the coast and whatnot. So the first principle of this digital cyberland grant is it must be place-centered, that place matters. Humans are terrestrial beings. We're not just in cyberspace. And, and the data shows that for first-generation college students, Pell Grant recipients, veterans, um, that sitting in a basement taking an online course just is not an adequate substitute of having someone put their hand on your shoulder saying, we'll get you through this calculus class, okay? So, uh, hence why our elite universities, which they are elites, and this is also collaborative, we'll get to one of the components. We want Harvard and Yale and Stanford to help this, but you notice they are very much on-premise. They're not becoming online universities. So first point, is a place matters. And, and as we're seeing it in these elections and, and these things going on right now, there's a bifurcation in our country very much. Um, and so place does matter. Um, but the programs have to be focused on this urgent need of this digitization of our society and our economy. And so um, the programs would be around artificial intelligence, digital analytics, cybersecurity, which may be the first among equals, because if you don't feel safe participating in this digital economy, will you participate? Um, we've got a huge unmanned test center. Um, we're now the headquarters of Global Hawk Unmanned Systems, and the Air Force has said over and over again, the last thing you want to do is automate all these things and then lose control of them. You know, I mean, it's like your worst science fiction movie. So the programs are focused on digitization, but a key point to get across is it includes the humanities, because we are also trying to civilize the machine, to say. One of my favorite books in story and technology by John Casson was called Civilize the Machine. And that's what Hamilton and Jefferson and Roosevelt and Dewey, um, these, these people that are like, industrialization is coming, but it must be better for people. And, and we now have to civilize the machine, but if you don't have some <coughs> digital knowledge understanding what's happening, how can you build the law school courses you need to to figure out, like Jared Melville was grappling with, what is it right to hand all our student data to this private vendor? And, and he was a head of Congress. They now have like a two, you know, two dozen people studying what are we doing with student data, okay? So programs, place, but also the people. The professors, uh, the tribal professors I've met, they are devoted to their, their students. And we have got to find a way to get more students in front of professors with a model that isn't tied up with tenure the way it is. And so one of the things the sacrifice faculty have to do, we still want to preserve tenure, but you've really got to start inviting in knowledge holders who haven't had the time to go through a doctoral program and then five years of the tenure track. It just, it's too long, takes too much time. And, um, and so that's the other part of the people part, is for the students and the professors that we've got to welcome in new knowledge holders that are in areas growing so fast that, um, that you, you can't wait that long. Um, but all that then, I hate to say it, um, and I see Brian Alexander just came in, so I'm very honored that you would come here. There's a big thinker on this stuff, I'm telling you. I was looking at your notes this morning getting ready. Um, okay, <laughs> but um, 
he, he actually came out to North Dakota and talked to the Western Consortium of Colleges and Universities. But a key thing, and I, you know, I'm a former Pentagon veteran, uh, you know, Afghan veteran, but money is, is basically um, action across generations, action distance. Money, I know it gets a bad name, but money is stored up action, okay? <laughs> um, and, like a okay, right. I mean, it is. It is. It's, it's money you've saved, and now it is acting. And, and there is a, a, a crisis of money in the Midwest and whatnot, um, if you can look at the data. Uh, only one public university is now in the top 20 in America. Um, and I won't mention any campuses by name other than to compliment them, um, because they're all trying hard. But four major Midwest universities with almost 200,000 students have an endowment of 11 billion, and several elite colleges we just mentioned have an endowment collective of 73 million, and they have 50,000 students. Yep, sorry, billion, billion. We're talking, so one-seventh the endowment, but four times the number of students. And meanwhile, as, as, as Kevin has written about so eloquently, the crisis in higher ed is funding its way into legislators who are cutting back funding. Um, UVA was funded at 37% uh, of their base budget in 1987. It's down to 14% state funding. So, so the states are strapped. So resources are a crucial part of this. Now, um, there is ideas like this bubbling on Capitol Hill. Um, you know, Representative Ro Khanna has an idea out there bubbling, and I've talked to some of his people, but um, that's based on deficit spending. The most radical idea in this proposal is you put a tax uh, or a data dividend or land rent on the social media companies. Uh, and the idea is like alcohol, gambling, cigarettes, we have taxes on them. So they should pay. And, and the, the idea is we don't indebt future generations. Um, so why is that? I mean, we just keep spending like crazy. Um, the, the time of reckoning is coming, I believe. But um, you know, in this audience, there's someone who, who isn't in a think tank, who doesn't have a relationship with her representative. She can't write yet. She can't even talk. She can crawl. But my granddaughter's back there. Do you mind again holding her up? There she is. And Anna Jane, we're not going to indebt you to pay for something, okay? Um, and even though it looks like my daughter, that's my wife holding her, actually. Uh, my daughter's over there. But, but seriously, I, I, you know, talking to some people, I said, hey, this debt things, we're never going to solve this. Just say, indebt us more. But it's just not right that a steel worker in Pittsburgh you know, is going to have to fund this type of thing. So it, financially, it's built on, on this, this data dividend. And, um, and so the last thing, though, is about partnerships. It is tax incentives and credentials sharing with the elite universities, the elite companies, um, philanthropy, that if you would invest in these things, there would be additional tax breaks. But also think of someone, um, let's say at Google, who's a programmer, and there's thousands. Um, they don't have a PhD yet, but they become a joint appointed professor at Standing Rock University, um, honoring the Sioux people. Who wouldn't want to do that, OK? But you've got to have a way to pull this all together. So those are the components, the place, the, the faculty models, the programs, resources, but then reaching out and having partner universities like Harvard might partner with Standing Rock, or Stanford might partner with North Dakota State. And philanthropists were given additional incentives um, to, to fund these things and, uh, and be partners. So um, there, there, I laid it out. And, and, I, and I'm taking more of your time. I'm sure you've got questions. You're ready to, to jump in there. Sure. You know, I mean, one thing, um, speaking back to the original uh, Moral Land Grant Act, and there were a couple of them, but the first one, which was passed in the heat of the Civil War, yeah. um, and, uh, but what was very much based on an awareness of the changing American economy. And it, it calls out in the legislation this idea that we need institutions for the uh, industrial classes, because we were in the middle of the um, industrial revolutions, plural. Um, who are the industrial classes of the 21st century? What kind of people um, are, need to be served by the kind of institutions that you want to create? Mm -hmm. Well, great point. And, and in the Morrell Act that Abraham Lincoln, and thank you for the Civil War thing, if you think this is not important because of what happened on Capitol Hill or is happening today, um, Lincoln signed out this law when you could almost hear the gunfire from the Second Battle of Bull Run. I mean, existential threat to Washington, and he said, we've got to do this. Um, so certainly we can handle the things on Capitol Hill on this. But yeah, the, the classes today um, are, are the, the post-industrial workers, right? Workers that are they're, they're watching um, the, the skills are built on tactile skills and whatnot becoming digital. 
Um, and that's why certificates be part of this mm -hmm. and two-year degrees. Um, this is also farmers. The equipment is becoming highly digital. All right? how, do we, how do we provide them um, the tools we need? In North Dakota, we have the director of a thing called Emerging Prairie um, that, that they're building a coding academy to help get this going because there's such a demand um, on these farms. I mean, literally, tractors are stopped in the field because they don't have the skills to program their tractors. So the agricultural classes, the industrial classes, but then people in general, because part of this is the civilized machine part. Every boater in America, in my opinion, should have a gen ed class on cyber and digital science to understand what is a botnet, you know, what, what, what's happening. And, um, and that was very much the vision of our founders. That's where many liberal arts, liberal arts classes and programs came from. So not just the workers, but the people in general need this. Well, I want to also ask a question with a comment on the, on the financing. So, mm -hmm. so as far as I'm concerned, the, the idea, the people who need the education, the place, absolutely, this, this simply must be nationwide. We, we cannot continue the, the, what Enrico Moretti calls the new geography of jobs, right? This clusters model where those who have have more, which is why many of us were so disappointed with Amazon's decision because it was a chance to choose North Dakota or Indianapolis or, you know, there are plenty of places in, across the country that have the ability uh, to and have tech sectors just need need more more help. So all of that, the place, the people, the kind of education. But so let's talk about the financing. So as somebody who spends a lot of time in Silicon mm -hmm. Valley raising mm -hmm. funds, uh, but also arguing about the need to put tech and policy together. I mean, in Washington, we don't talk tech enough. In Silicon Valley, they tend to ignore the policy piece. Mm -hmm. So it's really uh, arguing we need to believe. The idea of making this a kind of vice tax is not going to be wonderfully saleable. I mean, if I if you go to even take Google and Facebook uh, and you say, okay, so you guys are like tobacco or alcohol, and we're going to tax you to uh, educate another a new generation of workers, you need not they're not going to love it. That may not be the, the you know reason not to do it, but is there a way to think about this? much more affirmatively, I, obviously when you say digital dividend, that's part of it, but to say to all the tech companies, mm -hmm. right? And, and of course, tech is like electricity, and we're all, so that means every company, but can we uh, articulate a group of country, of companies that would be like the, the, the big industrial companies uh, of the last century, and think about how can you create a combination of a tax, I do think you need a tax, but also incentives. Mm -hmm. So it, it's really, how do we, we broaden this out? Because for me, it's very hard to see how you, you impose this on just a few mm -hmm. big companies. We may not, you know, many people may be a, opposed to them, but they also have very powerful lobbying arms, and we have to recognize the realities of that. No, it's, it's a great point, and I think you pointed that out four years ago, so that, that's going to be the hard part, right? Everyone loves, you know, helping students and helping workers, but okay, how to pay for it? Because I do believe the deficit's unsustainable. I mean, you know, there's any number of countries eventually have massive reckonings, and so it's coming. And and that part of the idea of this income stream is that if the budget deficit goes under under duress, it isn't like we'll cut that land grant thing. It has a separate funding stream tied to workforce research and whatnot. So I believe it could be in the 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 incentives are just in the benefits it accrues to the tech industry. Um, think of already the labor markets in Silicon Valley or the labor markets here. I've got friends at NSA who are already desperately trying to, to compete with these salaries. Now you have, you know, let's just take North Dakota, you know, the Fargo-Moorhead, Grand Forks area of about 300,000 people. You have a lot of, of hardworking kids. We find farmer uh, kids do really well. Once they're given about a six-month remedial on the, the math and science, they do incredibly well. We just won. Uh, you know, in the top 100 for one of our community colleges in oil country on oil cybersecurity. But it gives them a labor pool that, that they can do distance work, fly in maybe a couple days a month if needed, but it actually is an incentive because they are getting access to lower cost labor, highly motivated people, and quite frankly, to Rodney's point, they can get security clearances, okay, um, and, and do the classified work. But I'd also say there's a moral reason to do this, is uh, those of you who you know, familiar with Ray Kurzweil, Google, but you know, the whole idea of the singularity, right? That, that what comes after this moment of massive digitization, AI, is comes unrecognizable. Well, I would argue that that began in October 1969 when the internet came alive, and that was the creation of the foundation for cyberspace, which the American people owned that. I mean, that was American money, and so there's almost a moral thing of, we should have kept some patent rights to this. So 
So you know, maybe it's a data dividend or land rent of cyberspace. So I don't know. But you know, morally, I think that they should see that it is something that the American people probably shouldn't have given it away to begin with. We did. Um, and, and there's scholars saying it was the greatest wealth giveaway in the history of the planet. And so give some of it back. But you're probably right. There'll be resistance, and we've got to work on that. Th this is an initial concept for us to work on. And then we also want, I mean, to the point that Amory made about the uh, changing geography of employment, um, I completely agree about the necessity of place for learning. But then once people learn, they can move. And you've mm -hmm. talked about that. And so um, where is the, it seems like um, an important aspect of this will be making sure that the employers both inform the education mm -hmm. and are also prepared to uh, then take the graduates and employ them. Um, mm -hmm. what, like, what, is, what is your pitch to them? You talked about housing costs, for example, right. and right. we can sort of see this like mm -hmm. public policy catastrophe happening in, right. in right. not even slow motion in Silicon Valley right now, mm -hmm. you know, where there's just literally no place for anyone to live. Correct. Um, Amazon's coming here to Arlington, Virginia. I'm an Arlington resident. It's not cheap to live there. <laughs> um, so I assume that's part of, yeah. the, part of the appeal. Yeah, well, one of the appeals is, uh, again, North Dakota is an agricultural powerhouse, wind powerhouse, oil powerhouse. But people don't realize Microsoft's second biggest campus outside the Seattle area is in North Dakota. Our governor, um, uh, president of the Western Governor Association, is a software entrepreneur, and they have kept that place there for 20 years, and the workforce quality and loyalty. So I think they may realize you build real loyalty to these, these hubs, and you want to culturally connect. And that's the thing, you know, I know we're down to, we have someone showing his time here. Um, you know, in 1970, 80% uh, of, of the value of a company was in its capital, okay? Think of the assembly line at Ford. 20% was the intangibles. Now that has flipped. This is in Ryan Avant's book, The Wealth of Humans. I highly recommend um, Economist Editor. Um, and so it's in the people. It's in the culture. It's in the values. And we want these companies and these research universities to partner with the land grant. Let's say they, they partnered with the cyber land grant in North Dakota. It becomes a partner, um, joint appointments. I mean, think of a professor at Stanford going, I'm the distinguished professor of data analytics of North Dakota. Okay, you know, like you know what I'm saying? Yeah, I'm a distinguished professor at Standing Rock, you know, or Sitting Bull College at Standing Rock. Um, that type of thing. So the cultural connections, helping people out, and also stabilizing workforce and research. So um, I think it, they'll find a lot of things appealing. Marie, some final thoughts for us? Uh, well, let me, let me just uh, say again that this is the, whether you agree with the details or not, this is the kind of really bold thinking we need, a new generation of universities. And again, we've done it. If you look at the history of how education has evolved here, we've responded to need and we've said, OK, so you know, let's create high schools. Let's create land grant universities. Let's create community colleges. This is the kind of thinking that I think we need. And I particularly, and I, I would end there, this point that you know, it's cyber land is land. Cyberspace is land. We don't even talk about virtual reality anymore. We talk about mixed reality, or at least my children talk about mixed reality. For them, it's a pretty seamless interaction between the virtual world uh, and the physical world. And if that's true, then yes, we need to be able to have rent or taxes or other using cyberspace, cyber land, as a source of public revenue in the same way that we have always used both the, the federal land from the land grant universities, but frankly also our own, our own physical property. So it's the, I, I, I would end with the idea that this is the kind of thinking we need. I, there are parts of this idea I absolutely love, and I think, the, again, changing tenure, changing joint appointments, which you also have to do a lot of work with mm -hmm. a lot of universities to let their faculty have joint appointments, mm -hmm. but uh, that could be part of it. And thinking really boldly about how we provide for all Americans or how we ensure that all of our talent benefits from a digital bonanza is something I'm really grateful to, to hear and we're really happy to host. Terrific. Um, please join me in thanking our Thank first two speakers. You. Appreciate it. Um, and let me um, uh, let me invite sure, let me invite our uh, panelists to come and join us. I believe yes, yeah. So I think uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah. 
Oh, oh, you, oh, oh okay. We have five minutes of Q&A. Um, sorry. <laughs> um, we have five minutes of Q&A. Um, please, uh, please raise your hand and someone will bring a microphone to you. And um, uh, please just let us know who you are uh, and, uh, before you start your question. So I'm Dane Scow from North Dakota State University. Um, one Our of lead the, digital scientist, right. by the way. He's a ringer. One of the, uh, <laughs> the things is I come most of my career from Chicago and the, and the DOE National Laboratories. Mm. And one of the things that I have really noticed culturally coming to North Dakota is the value and the use of the contemplative function. These enforced hours of time behind the windshield where you have nothing to do other than pull all your thoughts together and, and um, let the free association happen are moments that you don't get in the hustle and bustle of New York City or Chicago. Mm -hmm. And I think that many of our um, long-lasting societal organizations have a portion of their um, society where it is the contemplative function. Your job is to take the long view and to say, does this make sense in my world, in my place? and get the, the variety of views back. So I think that that's one answer that needs to be folded into this question that my children on the East Coast are saying, um, isn't it just a preference that you want to live in rural America? And if it's more efficient for us to provide for you in the cities, why are you, aren't you just being a stubborn Luddite by not coming <laughs> into the center? And I think that even the, the fires in Australia one of the reasons that they have been so catastrophic has been that the um, planned burns have not been able to be done correctly because there isn't enough detailed knowledge about the particular land and the particular time to burn all of the things that are tied to the land. And I think that the market beautifully, this is about our country. And our country is the people, but it's also the land. And we have a custodial function to have people out in the land to take care of it, to make sure that the people in the cities can be fed and all the other things going on. So I think not only the funding, but one of the other challenges is how do we explain to our children in the cities why do we need rural communities of under 1,000 people? What's, their, what's the value proposition to them of sustaining these, these folks? So if you have other thoughts about how we might answer that question, that's the best I've come up with so far. And one comment, because I'm sure there's a lot of North Dakota. We are meeting at Founding Farmers at 3 o'clock. Anybody been to Founding Farmers before? It's a restaurant? Yeah. Down the street. Founded by the North Dakota Farmers Union, by the way. So we can continue that conversation on at 3 o'clock. Hi, I'm Lindsay Teepee with the Association of Public and Land Grant Universities. And I guess one of the things I was curious about as you were talking about finance is a lot of the companies that you named and quite a few others have tuition benefit partnerships. And I know Education Dive put out an article focused on, you know, what employees want from those partnerships. But it did get, spark my thinking in this conversation of there already is an education investment that a lot of these companies are making. And a lot of them have, even Walmart, I mean, online sales are a huge part of what makes them profitable today. Thinking about how they're harnessing education and having a more expansive view of developing the workforce, do you see that as a potential foundation for financing something like this? Or is it an idea you've considered at all? Those, those are great ideas because there is an extraordinary amount of work going on. I mean, Microsoft has been very generous in, in North Dakota as well. It's pulling this all together in a way that people can, can say, oh, something new is needed, and, and, and not just scholarships, but the money for the faculty to build them and to have new models. You know? and, and again, we'd still honor tenure. If you have tenure already, it's just to welcome new people. So no, that's, that's a great suggestion. So yeah, come at 3 o'clock at the restaurant if you want. <laughs> um, I'm Joan Centrella. I'm at West Virginia University and a uh, proud land-grant institution. <laughs> and um, I find your ideas very compelling. I do have a question about your idea with you talking about the farmers uh, learning the digital, how to run the tractors and everything, and then doing remote digital work with security clearances. So you talked about the importance of place. So these kids are on the North Dakota prairie, and the people who are running the secure operations and the whole you know, hive of activity is not. So 
I understand the idea of staying in place, but don't you need to have people from these other places come and stay in place to build up the culture there and to keep putting them hands on the back mm -hmm. like that? And, and in particular, I mean, I, th I, can, I think it's a great idea to have people from various elites come and be a professor, provided they don't just fly in and fly out. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. There needs to be a, pre there needs to be a mm -hmm. presence. Mm -hmm. And so how do you do that? That's really sharing of a lot of human capital mm -hmm. and um, cultural capital mm -hmm. with the parts of the world, the parts of the country that don't have that. And how mm -hmm. do you, because I don't think if you don't do that, you're mm -hmm. not going to change things very much. Mm -hmm. Yeah, do you want to try? So, jo on the on your point about not flying in, uh, flying out, which is is very important. But we've learned a good bit on distance learning. So one of the things we know, this was a study done probably 15 years ago by uh, the Fuqua Business School at Duke, on how to make uh, courses uh, that were mostly online work. And one of the things they found was you needed some really concentrated time together. At least three weeks is what they, they found. And that if you had three weeks together, where the, so that means the professor is in place and the students are in place, from the, then you could move to online because you'd built enough community that people would participate. And then maybe you have, you know, a, a, you come back in the middle of the semester or at the end. I think w part of what would make this work is a pretty dramatic change in the way all of us teach already. The semester system is for the birds. <laughs> I mean, the semester system, you know, my husband is, is offering two lectures a week, uh, the same course that I took in 1976, which was two lectures a week, which was the same course probably taught in 1926. I mean, excuse me. The world, and so the idea that you ought to be able to offer classes in like a th in, in intense modules, some maybe longer, some shorter. If, if student, you know, students and faculty can adjust to that, it's universities that say, nope, you know, we've got a 12-week semester or a 13-week semester that makes th the kind of thing you're talking about where someone could really be somewhere else, not for a whole semester, particularly if they've got families, but for concentrated time, I think could work. Um, we're going to hold further questions until after the panel. So thank you very much. And let me invite the panel to come up and have a seat. Yes, you can go now. All right. Thank you again. Yeah, thanks, Mark. So I'll start with some uh, brief introductions. Right to my uh, left is Rodney Peterson, um, who's the director of the National Initiative for Cybersecurity Education. Uh, nice. Are you nice? I am very nice. Okay. Thank you. Um, at the National Institute of Standards and Technology. Um, to his left um, is Tracy Ben Graff, who is the senior vice president of communications and public policy at Revolution, a venture capital firm. I don't know. I venture know, capital. I know, I know. Definitely um, the standout. And then uh, Carrie Billy, who is uh, president and CEO of the American Indian Higher Education Consortium and an enrolled member of the Navajo Nation and an attorney from Arizona. So welcome uh, all of you to New America. Thank you so much for participating. Um, I'm just going to start with an easy question. Um, what do you think? Is this a good idea? Should we do this? We'll start with you. OK. Um, well, first of all, I think I'm extremely qualified to be part of a panel of three lawyers up here, so you're going to get a lawyer's perspective, at least by way of our own disciplinary background. But, um, and, and secondly, I should add that I'm a product of the heartland growing up in rural Michigan, where I was in a small town of a thousand people that was our county seat, and um, also a product of two land-grant institutions. I worked at Michigan State University and the University of Maryland College Park. And so without getting into the economics and the taxes and the finances of that, I think the, it, Mark's paper referred to an inclusive digital economy. And not only does that work, that is absolutely essential, especially in the field of cybersecurity where we need as many people to participate and to contribute and the opportunities are endless as possible. So when I hear the word inclusive, you know, we often go to diversity and, you know, make sure we have women and minorities and veterans, people with disabilities, kind of those traditional classes. Um, but inclusion is kind of different, right? Diversity is like where you're going to have a party or a dance and you invite everybody to come. And inclusion is inviting everybody to dance, to be that partner, to participate, to actively contribute. And, and I think this conversation is an important one that we, quite frankly, don't have enough in NICE, which is about not those populations I just described, but what about truly rural America? What about 
um, you know, the students, the, the citizens who are part of the tribal communities. What about the citizens who are at a distance from major metropolitan areas? How do we reach them? How do we include them? How do we let them be a dance partner in this very important opportunity in the digital economy, which is cybersecurity, IT, data analytics, all the other things we've already talked about here today. So the devils and the details in terms of how we finance it, how we make it happen, but the notion of an inclusive digital economy is an essential. Sure, uh, you know, you introduced a little skepticism around uh, a venture capital firm being at the table, so I'll just kick it off by giving you all a little bit of background if you're not familiar with Revolution. It's a venture capital firm that was founded by Steve Case, the co-founder of AOL in 2005. And from the very beginning, it was really core to our investment philosophy that great companies can start and scale anywhere. And we were really purpose-driven to look at companies that were starting outside of the coastal tech hubs. And that eventually turned into something that we talk about as the Rise of the Rest initiative, which started out as a bus tour. We realized that we were looking at these companies, we were looking at these places, but we really had a role to play in being catalytic capital. So starting in 2014, we went out on a bus and we started doing bus tours to shine a spotlight on communities that were really starting to push startup ecosystems, really starting to push a tech sector where there hadn't been one before. And what that in, in eventually turned into was the Rise of the Rest Seed Fund, which is a pair of seed funds. We launched our first in 2017, our second late last year. They're backed by a series of extraordinary investors, entrepreneurs, um, and investors that were really committed to the idea that great companies, again, can start and scale anywhere, and the next great company could come from somewhere between the coasts. And we did that, A, because we believed it was the right thing to do. We believe, as many others have shared today, that it's really key to America's competitiveness. Um, right now, 75% of venture capital goes to just three states, California, New York, and Massachusetts. And if startups are the big job creators, then we shouldn't be surprised that people outside of those three states are really concerned about their livelihood. But again, back to your skepticism, we are not a nonprofit, we're a business. And we believe that while talent is equally distributed, opportunity is not. And there are great entrepreneurs, there are great companies that are located in cities outside the coast. And we really believe that it's a business opportunity for us to be able to build that network and leverage that network. Um, and it really has just been core, core to our business philosophy in doing so, and then, you know, I, I didn't bring The Economist cover, I don't have my visual aid, but <laughs> The Economist put out a piece last year that I think was a real turning point asking whether it was peak Silicon Valley. And I think there are really, really strong shifts, both because of what's happening with the cost of overhead and housing in cities like San Francisco and um, the outlying areas of Silicon Valley. But then also, we really see that sector expertise, the disruption that's happening right now, two core sectors of our economy, be it agriculture or healthcare, that that sector expertise, I think to your question earlier, is really valid, that it might be better to disrupt something like farming if you are actually drawing from the rich expertise of a farming community. So we see that as really key. And then, you know, to the question mm -hmm. about um, your, your proposal, education for us has always been a core piece of it. So we are constantly meeting with university leaders to explore what universities are doing to help create the workforce of the future because these startups can't grow and exist and build if they don't have the talent to draw from. So I agree, we need bold ideas, both to create the opportunities for learning, but then also to look at what we're teaching and are we really creating the education system that can train a future group of entrepreneurs to take on the changes in the information economy. Yeah, let me just build on something Tracy said, where she said that the um, opportunity doesn't exist, but the ta equally across this country, but the um, talent does. So people ask me sometimes, where are Indian reservations? Where where are the tribal colleges? And the easiest way to explain that to anyone is say, you know, have you all seen that Verizon map? or the AT&T map about their coverage, where all those shiny lines are, you know where the gaps are, the, the dark spots in that? That's Indian country. So you're exactly right. There is, and for this group, if you look at the Internet 2 map, look at that Internet 2 map, those big gaps, 
That's Indian country. That's where the tribal colleges are. So do I think we need this kind of bold, big idea? Yes, definitely, because we know the talent is there, but the opportunity is not. Mm -hmm. So this is a way, the cyber landscape uh, is a way to achieve some kind of equality for not only American Indians and Alaska Natives, but also everyone, all of rural America. You know, one of the hallmarks of the land-grant institutions um, in addition to the educational um, aspect is this idea of extension services. You know, I think a lot of, you know, one of the weaknesses of our higher education institutions can be that they become these sort of self-contained city-states with sort of a tenuous relationship with the, I don't know, like local police department, <laughs> um, and, and like not much more than that. Um, whereas land-grant universities, I think at their best, uh, reach out. Um, they have uh, authentic networks and relationships with the states they're in. Um, what kind of extension services would these institutions, should these kinds of institutions provide? What should they do that no one is doing now that is needed? What kind of extension services should the cyber land grant? Yeah, if we're just going to, uh, you know, we're going to, this is going to happen. We're going to, the hacker app plans are going to just go. And then so. Let, let me just. For a moment, yeah. I, I mean, I think implied there was the broadband connectivity, which we know mm -hmm. is a big detriment. Right. And, and Carrie and I were just talking yesterday by email that um, I, when I was part of Educause about 15 years ago, we had an NSF grant to do advanced networking for minority-serving institutions. Mm -hmm. and, and she's right to talk about the connectivity issue being a real challenge, but an opportunity, particularly for land-grant institutions, is to play a critical role in that connectivity for their state or for their region or their location. So when I was at the University of Maryland College Park, um, the University of Maryland was actually very intricately involved in trying to network the entire state. And even a state of Maryland, where you probably think of Central Maryland, you know, the big government corridor, Baltimore to DC, has rural Western Maryland and the Eastern Shore of Maryland, where connectivity is a problem, quite frankly. So I think, you know, just starting with that notion mm -hmm. of opportunity by way of broadband and internet connectivity. And I would add just one extension to that, which is infrastructure, more broadly speaking. Uh, I know the National Governors Association, which obviously this is an issue across the 50 states. Every year, the governor that's the chair has a priority um, signature project, and this year it's Governor Hogan from the state of Maryland, and it's infrastructure. So it's not just broadband, but transportation or communications or other ways that the opportunities are presented. And, and just a quick anecdote, uh, the NSA, located in Fort Meade, Maryland, uh, is working aggressively to recruit more people for, from example, inner city Baltimore. But for a high school student or a college student to get transportation from Baltimore to Fort Meade is not an easy thing to do, either by way of public transportation or via parents who had the means to get them there. So I think infrastructure concerns more broadly is part of that equation. Yeah. yeah. One way I think, if these existed now, um, one of the problems we have, all uh, American Indian tribes are the loss of our languages. Mm -hmm. um, some tribes, we were just talking with one tribal college president, there's 11,000 people on his reservation, but only 300 Cheyenne speakers. So it would be really great on the Northern Cheyenne Reservation in Montana if we were able to use the tribal colleges and their partner institutions to connect um, the homes throughout the reservation to, to a, a hub and deliver the Cheyenne language courses into the home. So it's not just the students at the college who are learning the language or the kids in the elementary school, but really using it in their homes and learning it, so intergenerational. So that's one example, one of the things that I think would be a great extension activity. Hmm. Another thing that, that may seem relatively simple by comparison, but when we, when we go out to more nascent or emerging startup communities, one thing that they really lack in comparison to Silicon Valley is this concept of network density. So if you were to live in Palo Alto and you were just going to grab a cup of coffee or sit or do work on your laptop, the chances that you would run into another founder, an investor, someone who can recommend a CTO for your burgeoning company is pretty high. That's not the case in other startup hubs. And so I think what universities really have a strong role to play is in just being a convener, a, 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 uh, um, a key entity in bringing other pieces of the community together. 
we'll go on tours to other cities where we'll try and bring together, let's say, you know, 10 founders from some of the later stage startups in that community. And it will be really surprising, but most of those people have never met one another. Mm -hmm. And so just bringing people together can really do so much for an entrepreneurial community in terms of getting them access to other founders and their experiences. But also a lot of these communities have legacy corporations that could serve as partners, mentors, customers. And so facilitating that sort of community and that sort of exchange is a really critical role. I mean, there feels like there's, I don't know if irony is the right word, but these are companies that are like largely based on the premise of um, connecting people electronically, and yet they need face-to-face -face <laughs> connections, yes, apparently. Yes, in many cases, that's, that's and, and will yeah. And will spend a lot of money. Again, it's not cheap to, to be there, right. but apparently it's worth it. Right. Um, so, that, I mean, that makes me think, you know, what realistically, what are the, the barrier, the overcomable barriers to this issue of where capital goes? I, you know, I, I completely understand um, uh, you have to run like a business or you wouldn't be a business. Right. And so um, we need to take that into account. Um, uh, the, the private markets are going to be determinative in a lot of ways in terms of where a lot of this money goes. Um, so is it... Is there some threshold level of interpersonal density that we just have to, to keep going until we get there? What, what has to happen? Yeah, I mean, I think it's part of it. As I mentioned earlier, I think you are starting to see a shift, right? So you have incredibly high overhead on the coast. You mm -hmm. have talent that is largely mercenary in a lot of these communities. And so there are really clear advantages to building either your company or what you're starting to see, to the earlier point about um, Microsoft, you're starting to see large tech companies um, set up additional hubs in other cities for a variety of reasons. Um, I also think policy has a really big role to play. Um, you know, we've seen some things at the federal level, things like the Jobs Act, but I think where we really see a lot of creative efforts is on a more local level, where you're starting to see things like angel tax credits, you're starting to see local economic development arms really set up or play a big role in setting up things like incubators and accelerators to, again, kind of artificially push this idea of network density. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I want to talk a little bit more specifically about cybersecurity, which is not the only um, part of this equation, but mm -hmm. it seems like a significant one, both from a workforce standpoint. I, mean, I, I take the metro into work, and I think you see all these ads, I mean, like all kinds of ads here in DC saying, online degree in this, and cybersecurity that. So it seems like the private labor market is pretty dynamic here. Um, but also, the, as you said, the need for cybersecurity, mm -hmm. that, that these, mm -hmm. um, uh, everybody kind of needs to feel safe, and um, where where are the opportunities between our nation's um, cybersecurity needs, either from a workforce standpoint or from a how secure things are standpoint, and the kind of investment <coughs> that's being proposed today? So first, apologize, getting over a cold here, so I'll try to make through it, but um, first of all, again, Mark's paper refers to diversifying economies, and I think we need to start with a focus there, because with all the work we do across the U.S., everybody wants to be the next Silicon Valley, the next tech hub, the next high-tech organization. Mm -hmm. Cybersecurity is not a sector. It cuts across every sector. Mm -hmm. And so you mentioned Indianapolis, and when I was in Indianapolis a year ago for a Midwest cyber tech conference, uh, at the convention center were the future farmers of America. And so you talk about agriculture, the agriculture sector is increasingly a high tech economy that needs cybersecurity. And so, you know, one place for communities to start is not to try to attract all the latest high tech companies and cybersecurity ventures into your area, but take your existing economies, tourism, retail, you know, whatever it might be, and look at how you can make cybersecurity better and make that a niche because, you know, increasingly it's part of your mission and it's going to be part of your business proposition, if you will. So think of it as broadly as possible. But even within the notion that it cuts across every sector, it is very multidisciplinary as well as multifaceted. So one of the things that NICE, the National Initiative for Cybersecurity Education, is known for is a workforce framework that tries to create a common taxonomy for talking about cybersecurity work. So you all probably think of, you know, we need to protect and defend our data, our computers, our network systems. Very fundamental and right in the center. But we also need to make sure the people that are operating and maintaining them, our IT staff, also are building it securely, it, deploying it securely, you know, applying patches and thinking with cybersecurity as kind of a mindset. In the same way, we need software developers and network engineers and R&D specialists to be developing the next generation of networks and technology securely. 
And on the other end of the continuum, we have law enforcement and other investigators who are covering up after incidents happen and doing digital forensics and cybercrime. So the opportunities are not just technical, they're not just technology, they're not just computer science and STEM, they're really multidisciplinary. And I kind of joked with our backgrounds up here being law and policy, but you know, I've been fortunate that much of my work over my career has been in technology policy because whether it's um, public policy or organizational policies and procedures or institutional processes, those are all critically important and we need people from those backgrounds as well doing cybersecurity. And, and the final thing I would say is that because of the complexity of cybersecurity, there's not a single way to fix things or resolve problems or prevent bad things from happening. We need a diversity of thought, a diversity of experience. And that only comes from the diverse um, demographics I talked about earlier in terms of gender, ethnicity, or whatever else. It comes about your experiences and your cultures and where you grew up and how you can begin to think like an adversary if you come from all over the world and all parts of America. So I think cybersecurity presents an opportunity uh, to really take this uh, diversity, this inclusion that rural America presents and put it into practice. Okay. okay. Um, I want to uh, shift back a little bit to the perspective of uh, tribal colleges. And we've talked about the, you talked about and you know, confirmed the, the dark space problem of the lack of technological infrastructure. Um, uh, are there other, again, thinking in terms of, of necessities and barriers, things that need to be in place so that these kinds of partnerships would be particularly successful in a collaboration with uh, uh, tribal colleges and universities? Like what has to happen to make sure that this works for your communities? I think um, what Tracy was talking about, having that in-person time where you're actually building relationships, we found to be really important. Um, we have, because our institutions are so isolated and there, are, there is an industry there now, um, there are tribal lands and there's just that kind of um, fear or of the unknown maybe, mm -hmm. that relationships haven't been developed. So bringing industry, what we found is bringing industry, tribal colleges, the tribes, the local governments together to really figure out what kind of, what, what plan works for them is extremely important. And it takes someone, um, a member of Congress or someone who can actually bring those people together. Um, they won't naturally come mm -hmm. together often. Mm -hmm. So having a <laughs> convener is, is critically important for mm -hmm. us. And are there, um, I mean, we have an existing infrastructure of land-grant institutions. And it's, kind of, it's interesting, it's kind of a mixed bag, right? I mean, like MIT is a land-grant institution, um, but we don't really think of it as one uh, Purdue is a land grant institution, and we very much think of it as one. So they kind of the way that these different institutions sort of evolved over time has been very different. And you know, our existing land grant institutions um, are, in some of them, are some of the most aggressive in terms of um, moving online. Even though I know that this proposal is about place-based education, it is, as Anne Marie said, you know, these distinctions between the the you know the real and the virtual are just kind of all bleeding together in terms of how we live our lives now. Um, are there certain, and I, uh, from each of your perspectives, some current combination of uh, academia and place and industry that you say it's really working there, outside of the ones we're all familiar with, not mm -hmm. Silicon Valley, not the Research Triangle, um, but other places in the United States that we can look to as examples um, in, if we're trying to build something like this out? And that question to all three of you. Well, we actually have a project funded by the Department of Energy with um, bringing the tribal colleges, industry, and the tribes together to create jobs. We have a mm -hmm. huge, high, very high unemployment rate on, um, on Indian reservations. And so to, uh, to address that, we need to create jobs, bring new jobs in. So our initiative is in advanced manufacturing. So we have in Crown Point, New Mexico, which is a very isolated part of New Mexico on the Navajo Nation. Uh, Na Navajo Technical University, which is the MIT of the Navajo Nation, working with the Navajo tribe, Boeing, and other industries to actually create jobs doing um, advanced manufacturing, 3D printing. And um, it's, a, it's a small initiative now, but it's growing. But building those kinds of alliances and partnerships, we've shown at Navajo Tech, also Turtle Mountain Community College in North Dakota is doing it. 
Bay Mills, which is in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. So there are examples of where this is actually working in tribal communities, which are mm -hmm. even more difficult often than just working at a local community college. Mm -hmm. I, I think the biggest example that comes to mind in the cybersecurity areas is the evolution of cyber ranges, which are these virtual platforms where um, students or practitioners, working adults can learn cybersecurity skills. Uh, the infrastructure might be centrally supported so we don't need it multiple times in the same state or across the country, uh, but it's a combination of in-person as well as virtual participation or competitions or exercises and the like. And, and many states have now got involved in, you know, rather than every university setting up a, a virtual cyber range, having one or two that kind of mm -hmm. serves the region and the location. And, 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 and I think it's, it's important in cybersecurity that you have the hands-on skills, the hands-on learning. You're going to be working as a team, so a certain amount of face-to-face -face interaction is important. But a lot of it is virtual as well. So I think it's a hybrid combination of when the face-to-face -face is appropriate, the online, the virtual, and the, the cyber ranges are emerging as one kind of common way to facilitate that. Cyber range is a little scary sounding to me. Are you worried that people... Well, I, I mean, it, it sounds I, like a band. Yeah, it sounds like a band. <laughs> well, it's certainly been used in the military yeah. and the DOD for a okay. long time for both offensive as well as yeah. defensive purposes. But I think it's it's a really a collaborative platform, and it's okay. an economy of scale issue, right? You know, in terms right. of being able to set up virtual environments that can be distributed across multiple organizations and multiple learners. Gotcha. Where between the coasts? You talked about that yeah. as your, yeah. Yeah, so um, it, it's interesting. I think you're starting to see now most major universities exploring centers for entrepreneurship and how they kind of, again, train the next generation to be entrepreneurs, to see entrepreneurship as a viable career path. Um, you know, the other day I learned actually Northwestern Law School has a center for entrepreneurship. So you're seeing it at various levels. Um, of education. It's no secret that ASU has done an incredible job um, creating a center of entrepreneurship. Um, we've seen all kinds of creative things. Uh, the Lausanne Center at the University of Utah is actually a living, a living center for students who are interested in entrepreneurship. They have an in-house maker lab. So there, there are really a lot of interesting new things, I think, happening at the university, of level, university level, again, to really push this idea of startups being a viable career path. And I'll also just add quickly, because I, I know we're getting short on time, that universities that do this the best, I think, are really accessing every part of the entrepreneurial community. So they're working with regional co-investors. You spoke early of a threshold, I think a real threshold moment for a lot of earlier stage startup ecosystems is this idea of a tentpole company, so a breakout hit like uh, Duo Security in Ann Arbor, Exact Target in Indianapolis. And what happens then is that you have this whole um, generation of startup executives that typically double down on the community. They will either fund the next generation of startups, they will start another, another startup in that community, and the universities that are really doing the best job are making sure that they're accessing all those various components. Terrific. Um, I want to make sure we have time for questions this time. So uh, audience questions, please uh, raise your hand and someone will bring you a microphone. I'm going to call on Brian Alexander if he doesn't, if no one says anything because. Um, <laughs> uh, in the back, yes, please. Oh, oh sorry. Um, here, yes. I'm Jessica Martinez. Um, I work at the federal government, but I'm speaking on behalf as a personal uh, a person who it was born and raised in rural America. So I, I'm so happy that you brought up the University of Utah. I am like raised, uh, I'm from northern part of Utah. So I, I went to the university, um, that's about an hour and a half away from my hometown. So I know, you know, involving all of these discussions is really great. I just, I want to know your thoughts on um, getting, assessing the people and the children who leave, like what is their, like what are your thoughts on incentives to bring them back, right? Mm -hmm. You know, my parents are still there, still in Tremonton, and you know, there's a part of me that I almost wonder like, maybe I should try and bring them back here, or you know, because I, I, the thought of going back there, it's a little bit like, you, sorry, let me reframe this. Is there a, a humanities aspects coming in to talk about the culture of the, the you know, communities that you want to make them a little bit more, um, uh, uh, 
glamorous, <laughs> glamorous is not the word, a little bit more like, you know, uh, attainable for people who have left. Mm -hmm. So I, I can answer that, I think, a little bit, probably more from um, the city perspective. I think from rural communities, it, it is really challenging. Um, I think you are seeing a generation of people, many of which are eager to be part of a renaissance in many of these cities outside of coastal tech hubs. And I think you're starting to see also a lot of cities um, and communities between the coasts that are actively trying to engage people who have left and try and encourage this boomerang of talent. So for example, Detroit does something every year um, sponsored both by Dan Gilbert and his team who are largely responsible for a lot of what's happened in Detroit, but also Cranes, um, the media outlet there, and it's called Detroit Homecoming. And they spend all year trying to get, actively get people who are from Detroit to come home and learn about what's happening there partially because they want them to invest there, but also because they want to encourage people to come back. And you've seen a number of cities take that model and replicate it successfully. So Buffalo actually just did, did something similar. So I think cities are catching on to this idea that, again, the coasts are becoming extraordinarily expensive, infrastructure, living there is challenging, and oh, maybe we should reach out to people who are from here or went to school here and might want to come back. I'm probably not a good example because I left the heartland to come to Washington, D.C., but the, the issue of workforce mobility is really important to the work that NICE is doing right now. In fact, in May, the president passed an ex executive order on cybersecurity workforce that really at its foundation recognized that the workforce is going to be more mobile in the future and people aren't going to stay with the same employer, the same job for a 30-year career that they did in the past. And so what does that mean from an opportunity standpoint? Well, from my perspective, one thing is that as opposed to people going between the public and private sector, if we want to keep them in the public sector, then let's make sure we offer rotational assignments or way for them to experience diverse workplaces, diverse work experiences in ways that benefit still the federal government, but they get a different kind of workplace experience. What about the fact they might go to the private sector, but then come back again? These exchange programs are another good opportunity. So I think we need to start embracing mobility and think of ways that we're going to facilitate it. And our, our framework, again, is a way that, you know, if any of us were employers on the stage, if we were all thinking of cybersecurity work differently, then an employee going to our three organizations is going to be frustrated. But if we start to standardize our lexicon, our taxonomy, our career pathways, our educational paths, and all the rest, it facilitates mobility because, quite frankly, we think that's going to be the new normal. Uh, but I did want to just finally say back to rural America, um, we generally know that students uh, go to college within maybe 30 miles of where they grow up and take jobs within 50 miles of where they go to college. So the type of mobility I'm talking about is the exception with somebody going from Michigan to coming to D.C. Most people do want to stay locally, and that opens a whole other set of challenges about telework policies, again, the infrastructure issues. You know, what's wrong with a Silicon Valley company employing somebody from Utah or Wyoming or Montana who can be a resident and live in that state where they maybe got their university education, but they're teleworking and paying taxes and being a citizen there and contributing to the local community. So I think we need to think a lot more creatively about the future of mobility with respect to the workforce and the kind of policies that need to support that. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, and we don't really have that problem of people moving away. I mean, there are, people do move away, but we, we are, as Native people, people of a place. So our homeland, where our land, that connection to the land is very important. So a lot of people in our communities stay in the communities, but they're staying in communities with very high unemployment rates and no jobs. So we've got to turn that around. This is a way to turn that around, to bring those cyber jobs um, to Indian country and to rural America, to, to allow people to stay so they can stay in the land between the four sacred mountains or wherever they're from. Yes. The other piece of this that's very important is that smaller rural communities can thrive if the local city can thrive. Right? One of the things that's happened with global agriculture is we've divorced the farmland from the city that it once supported. But for a whole lot of reasons, climate change probably dominant, but also shifting trade patterns, it, if, if an Indianapolis or a Bloomington, mm -hmm. or just to stay on Indiana, are thriving, 
that and you reconnect that to the smaller communities in the surrounding counties, that's all you need to do. You don't have to actually invest necessarily in every single small rural community being a hub. It, you just need to connect it to a hub that is closer than Washington, New York, <laughs> Seattle, or Boston. Mm -hmm. Right, that's very true. Um, uh, yes. Hi, Anne Florini. I'm with the uh, Washington, D.C. hub of Thunderbird School of Global Management, which is now part of Arizona State University. Um, I'd like to connect this conversation to some broader policy issues and try to get a sense of, are there ways in which those on the panel or the previous panel are trying to engage with some of these broader policy issues that are directly relevant? One, for example, is migration. So we know we have issues with immigration right now. We also know that migrants are a great source of entrepreneurial energy and that we have diasporas spreading all over the country. Is there any thought being given to how you channel some of that into the areas between the coasts so that you, you get synergies between those two? Um, second is actually going back to the previous panel when you were talking about taxes and revenues for, for land-grant universities. There's been more than a wealth transfer to the tech companies there's also been legalized tax evasion on a massive, massive scale that has drained tax revenues out of the system. Is there thought being given to how a more comprehensive revamp of the tax system might be needed if we're going to get beyond the, the current dilemma that we face? Well, um, I want to thank you for your comment about the tax system. Uh, as we're talking about the whole singularity concept, no one could anticipate this creation of cyberspace, which is, it's changing so much, and the wealth amassing there. And, and that's the idea of the singularity, that the, the laws and policies collapse and have to be remade. And that's why I'm saying Silicon Valley, I think, would respect that. On that fact about changing policy and law, um, North Dakota was the first to sue the Amazons uh, in 1993. They went all the way to the Supreme Court one of our senators um, was the attorney general, and they basically were sent to packing. But last year, South Dakota went back with Wayfair versus South Dakota and won. And already in one year, North Dakota has gotten $30 million more revenue. You don't want to think about what happened. It's the tax, tax. interstate and you know, yeah. digital commerce. Right. It, so they have to pay sales tax. And so just in one year, we have $30 million. Think if this had been happened 27 years ago. So you're right. It's We've missed a lot. There's a lot to make up. Um, but you know, I didn't get into, and I know there's people from campaigns in the room, I recognize people from different campaigns, but there's some people with some very destructive ideas, break up companies, uh, wealth taxes. This is a constructive way to start to right the wrong in a way that helps workforce, innovation, research. Um, so, um, so yeah, I think those things are coming, change the tax code, but I hope they're not as abrupt as some people might advocate, and, and rather this middle ground. At least that's one observation. I can weigh on, in on the, the immigration point. You know, I think from our perspective, the future of not any one startup ecosystem, but really America's startup economy is tied to immigration policy. And we supported during the last administration the international entrepreneur rule. Um, and we really believe as investors and many of the folks at Revolution Forum are entrepreneurs that it's critical that we enable people who come here, particularly folks who are coming, coming here, getting an education, have a great idea to be able to stay here and build those companies of tomorrow instead of us you know, saying, okay, we gave you an education, now go build your company elsewhere. Because, you know, and I, I won't belabor the point, but if you look at other countries, they really have taken from sort of the American innovation handbook and created really welcoming policies so that they can enable entrepreneurs to build companies there, whether it's the startup visa, which many, company, many countries have instituted. And I think we really need to take a close look at how we are welcoming folks to create those opportunities, which then will turn into job opportunities for everyone. Uh, yes, Ian. Hi, my name is Ian Wallace. I run the Cybersecurity Initiative here at New America. Um, one of the things that uh, we've done for a number of years now is work with Florida International University to help host the uh, NICE conference. And uh, before our last conference in November, uh, we worked with uh, some of Rodney's team to put on a, an international uh, day. Uh, and one of the striking things from that was the number of community college uh, who attended from sort of heartland states. Mm. 
who were very interested in learning how they could play their role in taking some of the educational products that they developed and, and using them to educate international students. And I think one of the opportunities with Mark's idea, although it's clearly very place-based and about in the community, once you're developing capacity building training products, if you're, if you're doing it in a way that reaches beyond boundaries, there's no reason why those boundaries should be national. And I think there is an opportunity to connect the heartland, not just to the coast, but, but to other countries, and use that as a comparative advantage. First, I wanted to thank everybody uh, for a very, very good panel and for the previous panel which uh, discussed and introduced this idea. Uh, my name is Brian Alexander. Um, I actually moved from rural Vermont to the DC area, uh, in part to make my business do better. Um, I'm also the author of a new book called Academia Next, which you should all buy, obviously. But the question I want to raise is about climate change. I want to circle back to that. Someone earlier mentioned this. And I want to see if you could extend your thinking forward about 20 or 40 years, thinking about what this kind of land grant initiative would look like given the impact of climate change as well as human efforts to mitigate and adapt to it. Right? For example, do you see the rural sectors of the United States as the home of post-carbon energy technologies, such as devoted to uh, solar and to wind? Or how do you see current higher education sectors based on the coasts endangered by rising waters? Do you see them, say, opening up branch campuses where it's not so wet? No, great question, um, and I, I know that um, many of the rural states are massive energy producers, and uh, North Dakota is very much devoted to carbon capture. You know, we have trillions of tons of lignite coal. I asked my dad, how did they survive in the 30s you know, in North Dakota when it was minus 30? He said, we dug the coal out of the hill by the house, and, and the, the pot belly stove was red hot. So. We have so much coal, and, and so we are very much devoted, and that would be part of this, because I think people know that whether it's robots or this, it's about digitization. It's big data. It's manipulating the data. Um, the tools to dig the coal out of the ground are not that hard. It's what are the processes which are driven by intelligent machines. So it ties, it, it could loop back to exactly what we're talking about here. Um, in fact, the people who won the cyber contest at a little community college in the Williston Basin were in the top 100 in America, but it was about that base of highly advanced robotic you know, equipment for, for fracking is what it was. Um, so good point, and I, I could see part of that. That'd be one of their strengths, back to what someone was saying here. I think you were saying, Rodney, what are your strengths? What can you secure in a cyber world? Same thing with advanced technology. Mm -hmm. And I, I would, I'd go even further and say when I was in North Dakota or m most uh, driving from sort of Death Valley to uh, LA, I was really struck that the farmers <coughs> of the future are farming sun and wind, right? That we need to rethink what farming is because they are farming energy, they're farming, they, these really are, they're wind farms, right? They're solar farms. So if we start to think about what we're growing or what we're farming, what we're raising, what we're producing, and you combine that with we mu either we find completely renewable jet fuel or we better go digital. And I'm all, I already have friends in Britain who are saying, no, I will not come to the United States because I've got four times I'm willing to tra travel transatlantically a year, and is this worth it? And frankly, my life would be improved by a, about a thousand percent if I spent more time online and less on a plane. Mm -hmm. So if we really think about what that means, where place becomes where we have to be and want to be and, and can be uh, connected, with a different concept of farming, then a lot of these places look really different than a world in which we assume we can hop on a plane whenever we need to. Did you want to respond? <laughs> previous point about cyber infrastructure and how grossly uneven it is in the U.S. I mean, we're watching 5G begin to get rolled out. Two years ago, the state of Vermont asked me to write a grant to add 2G to one county because they didn't, hadn't gotten that mm. far yet. They're not doing it right. Um, but I wonder, I mean, what kind of sense of place can we get if we're in places in North Dakota, Montana, Kansas, Iowa, mm -hmm. uh, Ohio, parts of Pennsylvania where they don't have the digital infrastructure necessary to have 
that kind of virtual presence where I can't go to Stonehenge or London or Moscow because we've only got four MBPS down and up. We need to solve that problem. I, I'd follow up on that. I, I think it's really interesting from an entrepreneurship perspective as well when you look at when, when you have that connectivity, what you can engender. So many people here have probably heard the case study of Chattanooga. They laid down fiber. They're now known as Gig City. And because they did that initially actually to welcome a VW plant because um, they would only come if they had a higher speed network um, that was secure from their, they're located in an area called Tornado Alley. Um, it actually created, really spurred the development of an innovation district that now, I mean, we're investors in a, a company in Chattanooga called Freight Waves. Um, it's a really interesting entrepreneurial community, really interesting transformation of logistics, which has been a historical industry there. So to your point, um, it really has an amazing effects for what attracting entrepreneurs and really supporting them. Right. And that's much easier to do in a even a small urban yes, area like absolutely. Chattanooga, not absolutely. in Vermont or Montana right. or North Dakota. Absolutely. So I think you're exactly right. We have to find other ways, new ways, uh, or maybe ways that exist now, but roll, the, um, but use them for bringing that kind of 5G, the new internet access to rural America. And we know that it can be done. The, the federal government's paying for that sometimes in other countries, mm -hmm. but we need to invest on in that here. Uh, and it's critically important for us for so many reasons, but one, you know, you were talking about climate change. Tribal lands really are the canary in the coal mine in terms mm -hmm. of climate change for uh, the United States. We have, we have a, a tribal college in Barrow, Alaska, Illisavik College, right on um, the north slope, the far, furthest most point in the United States. And um, their, that, their land is, is going out to sea. Mm -hmm. So um, we need to get access to them. We need to figure out ways to sustain their, their lifestyle and to allow them to build economies there. And you know, it can be done. We need these new big ideas to do it and people need to invest in it. We need to have the policies to do it. Um, I think we have time for a couple more questions. Uh, yes? Hi, my name is Rachel Rush Marlin with the Association of Community College Trustees, and we're working right now on a project around rural community colleges. Um, I think the importance of rural broadband uh, really hits home, especially in those areas. And I was wondering, kind of just going further down that line, there's been a lot of talk about different big ideas today, but I think one issue, especially in, I'm also from rural Vermont, mm -hmm. um, in areas like that, it's, it's really difficult and it's often uh, not cost effective. There's, there's no incentive for companies or communities to come together around this idea of rural broadband because it's just not affordable even with outside investment or you know other support so I'm wondering if from any of your perspectives there are some big ideas or unique ways to sort of get around these issues of building that infrastructure well I think what I was saying is that maybe it's not fiber everywhere there are other ways to deliver that, the internet access, the broadband access, and we need to be looking in that and investing in that and um, really in a serious way in rural America. Mm. Yes, sir. Hi, my name is Kevin Killian. I just wanted to ask about the old technology uh, using plants for carbon, um, carbon capture instead of the untested. Um, the new carbon capture is not really ready to roll, but the old, old um, using plants, giving it to farmers instead of the polluters, giving the, the money to the farmers instead of the polluters. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, um, yes. Well, I just wanted to, I, for, for all the liberal arts professors, mm -hmm. I, I missed one item I wanted to mention. Um, is this is hugely about. Um, you know, what kind of world do we build, right? I mean, most profound questions are coming out. Facial recognition technology, invasion of privacy, and I mentioned, you know, Mr. Melville right here who said, I think we need a policy. And I would just offer, um, I'm an old professor, but this book is by one of the leading AI scholars in the world, Stuart Russell. He's been writing on AI with Peter Norvig for 30 years. He just came out with a new book. His second to last page, basically, about the mass effects of you know, digitization, artificial intelligence says, the solution to this profound problem seems to be cultural, not technical. 
We need a new cultural movement to reshape our, our, our ideals and preferences towards basically this new world. And so I just want to be sure that the, the liberal arts professors who are here, you will have a huge responsibility in this of how do we interpret this, the policy, law, ethics, and whatnot. So I, I failed to get that. I brought it up the stage. I didn't use it, so thank you for you know, allowing me to say that. But they have to help civilize this massive machine. And here you have one leading AI specialist saying, and that's where the tribal values come in. I mean, just before you walked in, I was talking about the power place, that cultures that have lasted for 17,000 years, and I said they've been 17,000 years, and their ceremonies are still there. You have something to help us understand what this new world is, but you're not going to do it by making a move to California. You know, they're going to stay where they are, which is an honorable thing. So thank you. Oh, you get the last word. No, well, I, I want to make sure you, you a, a response to the point about um, old carbon capture planting trees. This is, again, to me, when we think about rural, when we think about farming, we need to change what we think about necessarily raising, right? We may be raising meat in test tubes and, and sun and wind and trees on land, uh, not trees to be cut down, just <laughs> trees to, to absorb car carbon. So again, I think that is a piece of, as we think about uh, really rethinking our own geography, which in the end, wh whether that geography is, ver is cyberspace as well as physical space, or whether it's cluster cities versus the rest of the country. And again, it has to be the whole country. Otherwise, our country comes apart. Other and we are seeing the for political forces right now between those who feel left behind and those who feel like that, you know, our incomes have just skyrocketed and we have everything we need at the push of a button sitting in a city like this. If we do not think, reconceive our own geography in those ways, but also what do rural, uh, rural spaces produce, values for sure, the beauty of nature still, and, and to me that is the beauty of the rows of a farm as well as, as a, a mountain range, uh, but also thinking about what we grow and where talent comes from. That's ultimately what we're, we're doing here. Um, I see from the back that Chancellor Hagrod's granddaughter says we're done. So, uh, <laughs> so we're done. Please join me in thanking our panelists. It was a wonderful discussion.